Okay, hi, I'm Rob Oyston and welcome to Sports Extra GB. We're going to explore the topic of homeschooling with a particular focus on primary schools. To do so, we have Gareth Rain, head teacher of St. Peter's Primary School, Cardiff. He's just taken over there recently, uh, following being head teacher at St. Uh, Joseph's Primary in Penarth. We also have Alex Locke, who's helping us run the stream in clearly uh, in the background and also pick up on some questions for us as we go through. Now, homeschooling has been a topic that has impacted every parent since the outbreak of COVID-19 and is a challenging one for me and perhaps even for Gareth himself and his family. So let's move on to the questions. Um, so obviously there's been a huge shift in the way that schooling works over a short period of time. So what would you like to say to parents who don't feel that they are doing enough? I've had a number of parents say, to me that they're worried are they doing enough so what would you say to those parents who are worried if they're doing enough uh so i'll probably respond to the, to the first bit about the huge shift it's it, it's incredible what's happened really so within a matter of days schools had to completely redesign how they work um and so even though some schools maybe kind of had watched the news from other countries china and then italy with school shutdowns um they still had to try and then plan in a very short space of time how they were going to continue providing lessons for pupils and trying to help to look after them with pretty much any advice at that stage and, and, and very little knowledge of what to do. So it's it incredible what schools have done in a very small amount of time. And then equally, it's amazing what families have been able to do. So I've been so impressed with how parents and carers have responded. They've been absolutely amazing. Um, so the first thing is don't beat yourself up. So whatever you are doing right now, it's probably right for you and your family. So I don't think that you can say, am I doing enough or am I doing too much? You just have to adjust. And some people now are starting to get into routines after kind of five or six weeks of being at home, but don't, don't beat yourself up. Just try your absolute best and, and really listen to the advice from your school. So Gareth, I think that's a really, really good, strong point. I think it's really important that we don't Beat ourselves up because we're actually in a place now where we've all got different set of circumstances some people at home will have um, both parents at home able to support some parents will have both parents out of work and their children will be going to the hub so i think that's a really really uh, big and important point for the uh, for, for the parents out there and, and definitely one that we need to take on board because i know it's been tough tough our end yeah uh, in, in my household um so to so link to that then um, and I guess you've probably already answered this, but how much time do you feel parents should spend homeschooling each day? Again, it's another question that I've been asked a lot or have heard through parents and friends. Yeah. Uh, okay, so th there's, there's no right answer as such, um, but my advice would be that the purposeful um, activities, the nature of the activities, how much your children get from them, is more important than the amount of time being spent completing them. So for instance, a really good mathematics activity that maybe takes 10 minutes of a video you're watching um, and then maybe 10 minutes follow up can be far more purposeful than a two hour activity that's a slog for the child and a slog for the parents and it creates rows and there's confusion, you don't know what to do. So I'd say it's it's how, how good the activity is, the quality of what goes on, um, much more so than the time taken. And then, okay. and then that would be the same then for other activities. So say, for instance, if you had in total in a whole day, maybe an hour and a half to two hours of really good quality work, that's far better than four hours of, of it feeling awful for everyone. So for you, definitely the quality over the quantity. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. OK, great. Um, and what do you feel the main focus of the home education experience should be on? Uh, so primarily well-being so making sure that everybody's okay within the home making sure that everybody feels um kind of physically fit as much as is possible with the the uh, limits that we have upon us right now um and then after that then kind of basic skills so uh, if you're in a welsh medium school that would be welsh language especially speaking welsh and if that's possible within the home environment then that's great if it's not for those children in welsh medium education then they need to find ways to try and speak welsh to others so that could be through peers chatting online via Zoom or Skype or those kind of things. If it's in an English medium household, then doing English uh, language skills, so especially focusing on reading, 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 absolutely. Um, and then activities. So 
really the, the basic skills. So the three things I would absolutely focus on would be well-being, English or Welsh skills and maths skills, and especially number. Okay, so those would be the, the key areas for yourself there. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's also important for everyone to remember that, um, yeah, we've gone from a system whereby um, everyone's going through the same system and now it's a very individual experience. Um, mm. And this is a, another question that people are unsure on and, and some people be more proactive than others. So what support can parents expect from their school? Uh, it's a really good question. Um, it will be different for every single school because as I said, there was no, right at the start, there was no guidance at all. Um, guidance documents have since come out from the Welsh Government, from local consortia within Wales. There are guidance documents for schools in England. Um, and then, of course, there are other things that parents can find out about what they think might work best at home. Um, in terms of communication from school, I think the most important thing is for schools to make sure that they tell parents what is expected of them. So for a nursery child, for instance, it might be that they want them to take part in just watching a couple of videos. It could be links to YouTube videos, such as um, somebody reading uh, The Hungry Caterpillar or it could be the teacher themselves providing a lovely little activity to do with nursery rhymes. And then say for instance, it was a mathematics activity in reception class, they might have to go away and order the size of their teddy bears within the house. And that would be a lovely activity. So thinking about comparing and ordering. If then we move on to slightly older children, maybe kind of six or seven year olds, then the schools should be making clear what they want them to do at home in terms of especially those basic skills developments. So reading, um, maybe a bit of writing, but also lovely things like not involving digital technologies, like making dens. If you're okay. lucky enough to have a garden, then to maybe go into the garden and do some things about collecting th you know, leaves and maybe pine cones or whatever's available right now. And then for those families who maybe don't have that luxury at the moment, to go out into the community and do those things. As children, of course, get older, then maybe more time is spent, um, not necessarily that it's always for the best, but maybe more time is spent sitting down and writing or making PowerPoints. But I would say to all ages, try not to make every activity about the computer screen. Try to make it that activities are away from the computer and even away from sitting down as well as those things that, that are required. So the schools should be communicating that to families, whether that's on a Monday every week once, um, and then they say about the whole week's worth of activities, or whether it's like St. Peter's and St. Joseph's before, whether that's every day they're saying, please complete this today. Um, and then they can amend as the week goes on, depending on success of the children's participation and, and how well they think they're doing. Just try and make sure that there is that communication. And then, of course, there's communication back to the school. So parents should absolutely say if they feel that there's too much being given right now or not enough. Um, uh, the communication between home and school is always important. And that's exactly the same at the moment. So, yeah, so definitely two way communications and, and at this time, probably more important than ever for parents to come back to the school and have that two way because of how, how different people's scenarios can be in. Yeah. And parents um, who are in that situation, maybe they work in the hospital or um, delivery drivers and they're working 12 hour shifts or even more. Almost the last thing they want to do is then come home and have to complete some schoolwork with their children. It feels like have to at that stage then when you're very, very tired. So letting schools know about that kind of situation is important too. let schools know, let the teachers know about your home circumstances. Um, they're, they're not going to look down on anybody in any way for um, schools. Don't do that with parents anyway, but they're, they're not going to say, oh, it's terrible that you're not helping at home or it's terrible that you don't have devices. Just tell. And, and, and especially on that point, if you don't have Wi-Fi or if your Wi-Fi is patchy or if you don't have a Chromebook or a laptop or a MacBook or, or whatever else, tell the schools and they can help you with these things. So I think that's a really strong uh, point for anyone who's and everyone who's listening, um, basically uh, to make sure that they, they have that communication with schools and, and that everyone that there's more empathy and understanding than ever in terms of everyone's individual experiences. Yeah. Um, another interesting point I think that you mentioned there was on the um, uh, not using the devices. So on the one hand, the devices have been yeah. a savior in, in, in some ways in terms of being able to communicate work. Uh, but I think that's a really strong point as well that you make that will help you guys at home, really, um, is about taking that time to make sure that you don't that, that, that you've got time to do something other than using the devices as a mechanism for the education. Yeah, it's all about balance. So um, there are uh, World Health Organization guidelines, for instance, for children between 0 and 
0 and 3, that I don't think they should be using any devices, um, any screens, ideally, between 0 and 3. Although, in reality, of course, we know that that, that isn't always the case. Um, and, and then between kind of the ages of three and five, it should be relatively limited a day, certainly no more than an hour, so absolutely no more, but maybe even kind of no more than half an hour, ideally, for a three-year-old. Um, and then that can change as, as children get older, but you, it, it's all about balance. It, it needs to be a balance of, of not sitting all day. And don't forget that, of course, time off right now for children is using their computer. The main way that they're communicating with their friends is via the Xbox or via the iPad or FaceTime or whatever else that they're doing. So if they're doing that in their leisure time and their play time, which we need to maybe be a little bit more lenient about right now for those parents who put limits on, on their children and use devices, and then they're using screens to complete their work as well. That's a lot of time in front of screens. So it is about balance, trying to uh, make sure that children do get outside that kind of once a day, um, but also do other activities within the home. Yeah, no, that's, that's really good points, Re really interesting. Um, and one thing I'd like you to, to go back to actually was your three key focus areas that you brought up, uh, which I thought were really strong with regards to uh, well-being. So if you could repeat those for everyone, that'd be uh, much, sure. you know. Yeah, of course, yeah. So, so, so well-being generally. So making sure that whatever works for your children in terms of reducing their levels of anxiety in normal times are likely to work now too, especially for children who've watched the news or are hearing of family members who are maybe ill or, or, or maybe family members who have passed away. Um, try and comfort them and help them in the best possible way, listen to them, um, but not necessarily maybe always involving them in things, not necessarily always telling them everything. So young children especially, they need to know enough, but they don't need to know everything. So, so sometimes shielding young children from the news is helping them with their well-being. So if, for instance, um, you know that your child really likes a, a warm bath every evening and, and that bedtime routine is really important, then keep to that bedtime routine. Um, talking to your children about uh, what they like and what they're enjoying right now is really important. Um, and then, of course, there might be things like in a Catholic school, helping children to maintain their um, prayers and their routines of prayers. And, and for instance, in Catholic schools that I've been involved with, we do things like Christian meditation and there's mindfulness activities that lots of other schools do. They can all help. Um, I would say it's difficult to introduce maybe something new in these situations, although parents are comfortable to do that, to do that. Um, but try and stick to routines that you know work with your families. And then of course, there's physical exercise as well. So Sports Extra providing some wonderful activities online right now for children, um, both in the living room and maybe in the garden if you have one. Um, of course, we know about Joe Wicks and we know about there's lots of other wonderful things online that children can take part in. That physical exercise will really help. To come back maybe then to the language skills, I think that, um, and, and I don't say this to try and scare people, but I think that those children who will be affected most by this in educational terms will be the kind of five to seven year olds. So that's the absolute key time in terms of reading taking off. Um, so those phonic activities are, are absolutely essential, making sure that children know their sounds so that they know the sounds. They know these sounds and then they know that this, what the sounds look like on the page, the graphemes that they know when they see letters and combinations of letters, that they make sounds and then they're able to blend them to read. That's the most important thing that you could do right now in terms of academic development. If you have a five to seven year old, go to a website called Read Write Inc. And they've got amazing videos for parents in how to support with phonics. They really are um, very important years in terms of early reading development. Try and take advice, try and help your children if you can, daily with phonics until they are reading with some fluency and that then goes right through to early key stage two until children kind of move from reading to um, learning to read and then reading becomes about learning itself you're reading for learning so that transition is really important so gareth i think that's really good and you, you've given a good reference there of a uh, site to look at uh, read writing yeah. yeah, read read writing. Alex, can you put that uh, on the scroll bar? Because I think that'll be really helpful for um, the people yeah. watching. So read writing as... Uh, read, write, ink. So the lady's name is Ruth Miskin. Read, write, ink. And they've got a parent's page that's got fantastic videos. So read, write, ink. Yeah? yeah. I-N-C. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, no, and again, I think it's really important what you, you mentioned there. So the three key areas that we've got there are well-being, um the maths well, and, and the reading and what, yeah. one thing one thing that i picked up there really was the age of who you you feel would be yeah i guess most affected or, or most 
um, yeah, most affected in terms of their development would be that yeah. five to seven year old age group. I, I, th I think that's the age group that probably when we come back to school are going to need the most in terms of um, uh, support, uh, intervention and, and um, what lots of people would call remediation to remedy. So to try and help to remedy what's going on or what's not going on that would have happened within the school environment. I think that um, some children at the age of three or four kind of just read almost without support. A very small minority of children, it just clicks early. For most children, it's around the sort of spring of year one, summer of year one. Some it's then maybe into year two, even into year three, four or five for others. Um, but that that transition of, like I said, learning to read to reading to learn is a really important time. And if your, if your children at home are in the early stages of still knowing their sounds, then try and keep those going. Try and keep them going if you can in a systematic way and look up online how to do that and take advice about how to do that. And then, of course, just as importantly, read to your children. Read with them and read to them. The bedtime stories, the stories throughout the day. Keeping on looking at books and sharing books and looking at print and enjoying the stories, that is as important um, right now at home as phonic development. Okay, no, that's that, that's really useful. And and basically, the, the the five to seven year old age is based on because that's when it's fundamental in terms of developing some of those skills. Yes, often yes, yeah, yeah. No, that's really good. Well, moving on to the the next question, uh, and this is one that we've definitely experienced at home as well. Um, so, what what can parents do? <laughs> I, I'm sure this will be the same for many, or I'm hoping anyway. Uh, what can parents do if they can't get their child to work? And is there any support that the school can offer? Because I think for every family, at some point, there's going to come that battle because some children are with their home comforts and, 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 and things are different. It's all strange, parents at home and, and all that. So, yeah, what can parents do if they can't get their child to work? And is there any support with that? Um, I, I, I feel your pain. <laughs> I know what that's like. I've got two boys myself. They are both in secondary school now. Um, and, and one uh, will, will do the work each day um, and then the other one will, but much more reluctantly. And, and then we will have um, all sorts of discussions about why it's important uh, almost on a daily basis. And, you know, um, it isn't always easy. It absolutely isn't easy. Um, so just we understand that we understand as schools, as teachers, that it isn't always easy and that some children will just do it because they want to do it. And some children will even want to do more, whereas others won't, won't want to do anything at all. I think that, again, I would go back to something I said previously about well-being. Whatever works usually, try and do. So when you're maybe doing homework that's been set by teachers and by schools in normal times, um, try and do those same things. Um, I think that uh, routines are very, very important. So, for instance, if you have a time in the day that works for you and works for your child, like, for instance, say you start work at half nine every morning and you always look at the English language skills first. I think that's really good. So, so for instance, the advice I've given to parents in St. Peter's School is to try and keep that daily routine. Maybe you start with English language work first and then you go into mathematics work and then something else like topic or RE work or IT or Welsh or whatever else has been set. And then you try and keep that going on the, on the daily basis. I think that families have in many schools been given timetables. Certainly, I know most secondary schools have given out timetables right now and quite a few primaries too. And if you can't find those or don't have those or haven't been given advice about routines, maybe look on the school website. There might be something there for you. Um, and then, of course, there's the dealing with the actual situation. I don't want to do it, man. Why do I have to do this? Yeah. What's the point? We're not in school right now. It's a different time. My friends are not doing it. I don't have to do it. It's not helping me. You know, all of those things that will be said probably have been heard either daily or weekly or, or maybe more infrequently for some. So in that moment, try, if you can, to avoid the battle, but also make it clear. So, so communicate with your child and tell them why it's really important. They have to do these things um, because their, their development relies upon them doing these things. So I wouldn't necessarily say you have to force the issue. And it might be that you say, right, well, we're not going to do it right now, but we'll come back to it in 20 minutes. And in 20 minutes, we are going to take part in these activities and we are going to complete them to the best of your ability. And I'll help you when I can. Although I know that lots of mums and dads and carers are trying to complete their own work at the same time. I think that um, rewards work, certainly. Um, 
Uh, I know that some people don't like um, the idea of praise and, and tangible rewards and so on, but they do. Um, so, for instance, in my house, we don't let our children have their devices to work in, a, in with their friends until they finish their work. So they don't get the iPad or they don't get the Xbox until they finish their work. That's what works in my house and for me. For others, it might be slightly different. Um, and it could be that some teenagers especially, and I know we're talking mostly about primary schools, but for some teenagers especially, it could be that in the afternoon or even early evening is the best time for them to work. And then you need to figure that out for yourself. So whatever works within your house, go with. Your parents know their children better than anyone else. So they need to try and use their own judgment. So again, it's about that flexibility, not being rigid with regards to the timings. Uh, and again, applying some balance. And I guess understanding in terms of it is a, it's a strange environment for the children as well, linking back to their, to their well-being. Well yeah. um, so that's a very difficult question to ask you in many ways, because uh, I don't think there's any golden bullet, if you like, for, for that one in terms of um, get, getting your children to work if they don't want to. But I think there are a number of strategies that you outline that will help with that. Uh, on the flip side, what can a parent do? And this is a much easier one, really. But what can a parent do if the child's finding the work too easy uh, and actually they want to do more work? And perhaps there's a well-being uh, issue on that as well in terms of um, making sure that they don't go crazy doing too much work. Yes, yeah, um, absolutely. So some children do want to do more work and some children are absolutely missing the structure and the routine of their school right now. In fact, I would, I would probably suggest that it would be kind of the majority to most children are missing the structure and the routine of, of yeah. school right now. Um, and certainly the social side of things as much as the academic side of things. For those children who want to do more, then great, parents can find other things to do. So go again with what the school has suggested and provided. Personally, I think that the input um, in terms of the instruction is really important. So if schools are providing actual teaching, whether it's what we call synchronous or whether it's live teaching, via Zoom or Skype or Microsoft Teams or whatever else that they're using, or it's asynchronous, whether they're then providing videos that children can watch in their own time. And that's often more helpful in terms of helping with family life, as well as kind of safeguarding issues. Um, I think that uh, then the follow up activities that come after that sort of input and after that instruction, the follow up activities probably right now need to be a little bit easier than they would get in school. Yeah. Um, and that's because in school, teachers can often help children to work through the activities. So whether it's with young children, they're sitting with a group or whether they have one to one support usually, or maybe with slightly older children, it's just kind of the teacher helping the whole class. Often that support that goes on in a school can make the work harder than it would be at home because the teacher is there to support. I know that lots of parents can support in the same way, but certainly not all parents can. There can be language issues, there can be basic skills issues, there can be all sorts of things. And then the harder the work, the more, the more likely it is that the battle is going to be there as well. So I don't think I would be too worried right now if the work seems to be a bit easy. I would be a little bit more worried if the work seems to be too difficult every single time. So, so sometimes it should be hard, but if it's hard every single time, I think that's maybe more of a concern and that's maybe where you need to communicate with teachers even more so. So, so to come back to the original point, if parents want to find more work to do, great. So complete the work that's done within the school, go on to BBC Bite Size, go to Oak Academy, go to all sorts of different wonderful websites um, and, and then give extra things to do. Yeah, do you know what? I think you picked up on a really important point there with regards to um, there'd be some parents who are worried that maybe the work is too easy and it's not pushing their child. But I think it's a really good point in in that um, there's a reason the work can be harder in school where you've got all the expertise and you've got that structured environment to be able to do that. So I think that's a really, really good point. Um, yeah. Linked to something you've also touched on in terms of children missing the structure and school environment uh, and, and linking mm -hmm. to their well-being, is there any um, support available for children if they're missing their friends, uh, if they're missing the general school environment, and that can include the teachers as well? And basically that routine and familiarity, I know this is a really challenging question. Again, we don't expect you to have uh, all the answers as such, but it's, it's more to do with, yeah, is, is there any support for those children who are missing their friends, um, missing the school environment and missing the routine? Um, I think the simple answer is it depends. Um, so it depends, for instance, if there are children who have um, particular ALN issues or are vulnerable in, in other ways, then um, depending on which local authority 
your, your, you, in which you live, um, there, there's different kinds of support. So, for instance, in some local authorities, they're allowing children who have vulnerabilities to go to hubs, maybe some respite for parents or carers with, with children with ALN to go into hubs, whereas in other local authorities and within other hubs, they're saying you no know, children should only come if they're children of key workers. So, yeah. so kind of it depends in terms of that practical support that can be given by school staff directly. Then there's the remote support that can be given. And maybe something I should have said kind of right at the outset is that what's going on right now, um, I've, I've, I've read, can be categorised as emergency online teaching. So this is something that none of our schools have ever prepared for. So we have all sorts of contingency plans for, for fires and floods and setting up schools elsewhere. I think that very few schools had contingency plans for setting up schools at home. Um, and so what in Wales we've now come to call what we're doing is distance learning. So the ways that schools are choosing to, to, to do their distance learning um, is very different. So some schools are using Google Classroom, some schools are using Hub, some schools are using emails, some schools are sending out written sheets and instructions for parents once a week. There's all sorts of different things going on. So to come back to your point about what practical support can be given, it depends on the school. If it's Google Classroom, children can ask questions of their teachers quite easily. There's a thread that goes on. If it's Hub, it's relatively easy as well. And although teachers can't kind of necessarily be at the beck and call of all children all the time, they have to continue working in other ways. They have to plan, they have to assess. They can't answer questions always immediately. That two-way process can be helpful through that kind of conversation. Um, the other thing that's happening is that lots of schools are phoning parents and asking to speak to the children. So maybe weekly or fortnightly. And then that kind of chat about systems and routines and so on, that can happen via those phone calls. Yeah, and actually the, the phone call, uh, so we had a phone call and uh, that definitely um, of, of the teachers and that definitely had an impact on, on our children in terms of, um, yeah, yeah they, they, they like to hear the teacher's voice. It's lovely. Uh, it was, it was a po yeah, definitely a very positive experience for sure. Yeah. And I think that those schools who are providing instructions through videos, um, I think that really helps children as well, whether it's daily or a couple of times a week, they're seeing their teacher maybe on the screen or they're, they're at least hearing their teacher's voice. And I think that kind of connection, although it's one way, I think that connection is still really good. Um, so, so those schools who are providing synchronous teaching, that two-way video or that two-way chat or sound, that, that is going on. Um, there are, of course, difficulties in terms of equity of synchronous teaching because not all families are in a situation where they can be online at 11 o'clock if that's the time set by the school or 2 o'clock if that's the time set. And then, of course, there's all the safeguarding issues about what maybe could pop up on the camera or what's said or other people coming in. So, so there's, 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 there's good things and there's bad things about synchronous teaching. Um, certainly using live video, but I would suggest that parents themselves could help to set up Zoom chats or Teams chats or Skype chats. So those kind of three or four best friends can get together and chat to each other, or maybe even a wider group, maybe even a kind of 10 or 15 families who really want to take part, or maybe even sometimes for special occasions like birthdays and so on. I, I've, I've seen and heard of parents who've sent emails and said, could you all come online at this particular time? And then maybe just sing happy birthday or wish so-and-so happy birthday. I think those kind of things are, are, are lovely as well. So there's all sorts of things the families can do for themselves there. Yeah, definitely. So the, 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 the school support things that have been offered, the, the phone calls in some schools and some environments, and then the, the setup of the online learning. But more importantly, it's about the initiative that, that parents take at home uh, to organise group activities for their for their yeah. children to socialise. Now, I think that's, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a really good point. Um, and now, and again, I appreciate you mentioned the In Sports Extra alongside uh, Joe Wick earlier. Um, but the, the key thing for us isn't actually to promote that at all. But what I think is really important to know, and, and especially where you've got some children who be in flats, is how is it important do you feel it is for children to remain physically active uh, and what support would you recommend and again not not aimed at us but you know other things that you you think children can do yeah so how important is physical activity and what would you recommend those are the two key so so physical activity is extremely important always so in these times as, as in any times um so where possible um and kind of uh 
in terms of the confines of a, of a, a flat or an apartment or a house or um, where, wherever you live, where possible, children should try and get breathless, ideally even a couple of times a day. So there kind of can be quick exercises. So if you've got enough room for children to kind of run and jump about and maybe do some skipping or, or whatever it might be, children getting breathless is really important. So getting that heart pumping, getting the lungs working harder, so maybe even if that means going out into the street and, and getting on their bike when you have your walk once a day um, and allowing, depending again on the age of the children and, and, and safety parameters and, and, and all, those sort of, all of those sorts of things, allowing children to just get outside into the fresh air is going to help as well. So I know it's quite limiting. I know that lots of families don't have the luxury of a garden right now, but trying to make sure that they do take part in exercise that will get them to to get that blood pumping is the most important thing. And if you can do that twice or even three times a day, even better. So yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with that. And, and one key recommendation there is, is whilst you go out for your, your daily walk or, or exercise routine, the children can, can use their bikes. Uh, activities, so individual activities like skipping, those sorts of things. And then are there any yeah. sort of um, stimulus, so like, I guess like Joe Wick, um, like ourselves offering other, yeah. other, other types of activity because that's where there's a bit of stimulus for the children to engage with rather than having to invent I guess yeah and, that, and that's always lovely too and there are lots and lots of things that where they're kind of um setting 30 days worth of do this on a Monday do this on a Tuesday do this on the five, fifth day and this on the seventh day there's lots of nice things online in that way as well um what Joe Wicks is good at of course is getting exactly what I said earlier getting the help Pump, um, racing and pumping blood and getting those lungs working and then what sports extra are offering as well is skills based lessons so that's lovely too so how to pass and how and, and how to maybe dribble or or that kind of thing so that's something that joe wicks is offering and that's something that sports extra is offering and, and maybe doing the two things can really help as well so it's a long time that children are going without their football teams or their dance lessons or their ballet or their rugby activities. It's a long time and it might be a long time yet. It might be the autumn, it might not even be the autumn. It might be the spring, who, who, we really yeah. don't know yet. So so trying to keep going with those sorts of things. So for instance, my son was in the garden yesterday um, with me and he was practicing his rugby passing. Okay. We don't do that every day, but it was lovely to do that yesterday. All it was was 10 minutes, 10 minutes of, of you know, as simple as that. If you, if you have the luxury of being able to get outside and doing that kind of thing on that daily walk or, or wherever else, then great. Try and keep those things going too. And, and I imagine it's about establishing, trying to establish the routine. So the children have gone from the position where they've got the routine and structure and it's about how, how we can, within reasonable and if it's possible, to establish yeah. those sorts of routines. For, for children's well-being, I think routines are, are hugely important. So if your daily walk or your daily exercises at two o'clock, then try and maintain it at two o'clock every day or half past six in the evening or whatever time of day it is. And, and similarly with the actual kind of school work that's going on as well, um, or access to Xbox, um, whatever it is, I think daily routines are really important. Children love and thrive on routine. I think it's very, very, very important. And to be fair, we're no different as adults as well. I think it helps, helps adults, yeah. it'll, it'll help parents. So I think it'll make it a more seamless experience. So, Yes, Moving yeah. on to, to the next question, so, and this is a, a fairly big one, but what, what would be your message that you'd like to give those parents who are worried about homeschooling? Because, and I think there's been some amazing things that you, you've mentioned, um, but yeah, what would the message be to those who, who are still a little bit worried about homeschooling? Uh, so first of all, well done. So well done and thank you. Um, parents are trying their best. Everybody is just trying their best. Um, so tr try not to worry, try and relax a little bit. As I said, right at the start, don't kind of beat yourself up if you don't feel like you're doing a good enough job. Whatever you are doing right now, I'm sure is the best that you can possibly do. So keep doing that. Um, and, and if you by now have got a structured routine, and if by now your children know what is expected of them, whether it means starting at nine o'clock every day, or, or kind of, um, I know that my wife, for instance, she's a teacher too, she had work sent to her at seven o'clock this morning. So that in that household, that's the structure and routine that those children have. Great. Um, and if that's what works for those families, then also great. So just do the very best that you can. Follow the advice of the school. Try to make sure that you're getting some regular exercise for both you and your children. Try to make sure that you're also having some downtime when you're just relaxing um, and, and, and look after yourselves. Yeah, I think that's a really positive note. And I think that the well done to everyone for taking the reins because yeah. It's a new situation for the schools. It's a new situation for everyone. And that's really key. And, 
And actually, just to finish up on the, the key questions that I've got, um, and this is another positive one, really. So we're, we're talking a lot about the worries and, and concerns mm. about this, but I also feel there's opportunities and because we're, we're actually home together as families. So I just wondered from, from your point of view, Gareth, what you felt the, you know, the opportunities are of, of, of this unique period of time. Uh, again, it depends on the situation of the family. So um, for those people who may be two parents or one parent in the home uh, are going out to work for long shifts every day, I think that's hard. Um, I think it's maybe even harder now because the shifts might be even longer than they were in normal times. Um, uh, I think the opportunities are to try and, and, and connect. So most families or many families have, um, you know, really great and positive relationships in, anyway. And, and, and I, th I think the, the maybe uh, the anxieties and the worries are um, uh, uh, maybe for some kind of going away by now. Um, and for others, they're getting more so as as we feel like we're maybe stuck in the home or there doesn't seem to be uh, an end in sight or resolution. The, the opportunities, I think, would just be to spend time together. So I know, for instance, in, in, in my family, we're playing a few more games together. So board games. Um, and I and I love that. And my children love that. We're doing um, kind of quizzes via Zoom or Skype with other family members as well. And, that, and that's lovely, too. So it's, it's not something that we've done before, but it's a really nice way to connect and I hope that it's something that we carry on doing after the lockdown. Um, so, so again, I think it's always what works for you. So something that I would like to say maybe to families as well is don't, uh, and this, this is kind of general advice as well as right now, don't look on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram and think, oh my gosh, that family has nailed it. They're doing so well right now. Or look at the wonderful time they're having, or they're making these really fun home videos. And look at their pictures of the fantastic breakfast table or the dining table. It looks like it's a wonderful home school. Oh my gosh, that family is amazing. And, and, and I'm not doing a good enough job. D don't do that. Don't do that to yourself in, in ever. Don't do that to yourself ever. Don't worry about what Facebook shows to be a wonderful life. Nobody's life is perfect. Nobody's life is absolutely wonderful all of the time. So do the best that you can. Keep on working with your family. Keep on having a lovely time together and connecting and making sure you have enough laughter and joy as you possibly can. Um, and and like I said, just just sharing those good times together. No, I think that's a really good point. And, and I guess, especially with the social media there, but to be fair, that applies uh, before COVID-19, during <laughs> and after COVID-19, that not looking at what other people there. But the other point as well is there are opportunities in this. So connecting mm -hmm. with Zoom. So there might be might be older family members who haven't used Zoom before and, and younger family members who haven't yeah. used Zoom before. Um, and the fact that we've now got that alternative way of connecting should stand us in good stead as we move forward. Yeah, so, and within the community too. So members of, uh, so for instance, I now see the people in my street Thursday evenings when we're all clapping for carers and so on. I now see my neighbours more than I did before. I know when we're out on our daily walks, we're seeing people in our community um, daily now and kind of nodding our heads to each other that I didn't know before. So I think those kind of things are lovely too. I totally agree. And that's it's bringing communities closer together. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Fantastic, yeah. So what we're looking at doing now is, um, Gareth, I'm just going to ask if you could give a, a, a mini wrap up really. And then Alex is going to uh, ask some questions um, from the, that have come through from the comments. I can't see those, to be honest, but Alex will come in and, and ask a few of those. So, yeah, Gareth, um, I mean, the key things I've got from you is, is, is the, well, there's a lot actually there, but the three key areas really is looking after that health and well-being and yeah. the well-being side, um, really focusing around the mental as well as the physical. Yeah, uh, absolutely. From an educational point of view, the, the key focus is, if, if there are to be them, is on the maths and the English. Uh, and that's particularly important for the five to seven year olds. Um, yeah, for, for all, yeah, for absolutely for all ages. But that that's a really key time in terms of phonics and reading and so on. Um, and then when it comes back to maths, um, the, the 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 things that we've always talked about. So times tables are really 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 important. So say for instance, uh, an eight year old came back to school knowing most of their times tables and having read a lot more. I think that would be a wonderful thing. I think yeah. that any parent or any child who's had that experience. I think that they would come back to school ready to then take off in other ways. And, 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 and so the, often the simple things are the most effective and the best things of all. Being able to add and take away within 20, knowing your times tables, wonderful. Come back to school knowing that and being able to do that, I'd be more than happy. No, that's amazing. And, and Alex, I'm just gonna ask for the top three questions, uh, if I may, just because of time. Cool, just one main question really. I've just been having a, a text conversation with someone where the parents of the family are second language English. 
Yeah. Um, so they may be struggling to interpret mm. and access work. Um, so they're just looking for advice on how they can access uh, and whether there's any support on using that. So that's that's the main one, to be honest. So I'll leave that to you guys. Yeah, that's a uh, it's a really tough one. It's a really tough one in, in, in any time really about um, second language. So uh, where possible, um, schools that have provided either video lessons or audio lessons, I think that really helps people with second language English. I think it really does help. Um, there are amazing things now like Google Translate. And if you have a smartphone, you can download the Google app and you can put it over it and will translate. So any, any kind of print, um, it will translate it. If it's on the screen automatically, of course, you can put it into Google Translate or other translation um, websites and that will really help you too. And then of course, there are, there are I, I, I don't know right now, but there are undoubtedly translation kind of services out there and, and the ones that maybe families would use normally. So in the Vale, for instance, there's a, a, a phone call um, that you can make to an organization called Families First. And you can phone Families First and they will give you wonderful advice, whether it's about financial issues, whether it's about well-being issues, whether it's about academic issues or language issues. They can tell you about the agencies to go to. And in every authority, there are probably equivalent um, so definitely in Cardiff, there are equivalent services. I know, for instance, you can phone the helpline in, in Cardiff Library and they can tell you about where to go and, and how to access place, different, different places that can help you. So there are services out there. It's about kind of that very first one that's the key to accessing them. And I know, like I said, within Cardiff, that, that would be Cardiff Central Library. They can help you to know where to go. No, thanks for that, Gareth. Very, very useful. And um, I'm going to ask you a difficult question now to uh, to wrap up. But if you could, um, yeah, if you could sum up what you have said in, um, yeah, one or two. Um, oh, we got a question. Yeah. <laughs> your dad is. <laughs> <laughs> How's your dad? He coached me in rugby. He's That's really it. Well. Thank, thank you for asking. He's really, really well. Yes. No, no thanks for that question. That's, that's great. Uh, but yeah, if you could wrap up in two, two, two three sentences. Um, the theme on homeschooling, um, the, the key points that you'd like to get across to people. Yeah, so do the best that you can, keep going with basic skills, uh, uh, and, and even though it sounds a bit like Jerry Springer, look after yourselves, look after yourselves and each other. <laughs> that's, no, that's really good. Um, no, thanks a lot for Gareth, I think that's been fantastic, been certainly really interesting for me uh, in terms of, of what we're going to do with, with our family moving forward, and, and, also, and also a lot of reassurance, if I'm honest. Um, <laughs> We've also got, um, moving on there, I, th I think some amazing points for people from a very, you know, varying different um, backgrounds there. So support for people with additional languages as well. Um, I think it gives us an insight into what schools um, are able to provide and also how much um, parents should and shouldn't do and not to beat themselves up being the key point that you mentioned there. Absolutely. Just try your best, everybody. Schools yeah. themselves, parents themselves, just try your best. No, I really appreciate that. And then. We have a big thank you to everyone who's come in and listened um, to this. We hope uh, that you found it helpful. And I, I just made some notes here on, on the, the, the key points. And again, reiterating what Gareth said is don't beat yourselves up. This is an emergency situation. Um, when it comes to the homeschool, and it's the quality, not necessarily the quantity, the three key Definitely. important areas are the well-being, so physical health, uh, maths and reading being key areas of education. And exactly as Gareth says, to look after, look after yourselves. So again, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having Gareth on. Yeah. It's been great to have Gareth on. I think he's been absolutely fantastic. Definitely made my job easy anyway. Um, and we've got another talk coming up on Thursday with specifically on health and well-being, actually. So uh, again, I'm Rob Oyston from Sports Extra, more than just sport. And we'll see you guys later. So Ali, if you can end us there, please. Thank you.